Is it possible to make economy regenerative? Can we make e-commerce advertising, for example, more sustainable? And prove it. Mathias Bossono is the founder of Handprint. They have a digital infrastructure powering science-based regeneration. They have 25 employees, they have financed 2.5 million square meters of ecosystem, and they are making six figures revenue monthly. Today, we are going to talk about how they went from a few hundred dollars per month to multi-million contracts in a few months. So we are going to dive deep into how to find a new product market fit and how to get big, big contracts within the fintech industry. Mathias, welcome to Mission First. How are you? Bonjour, bonjour, and welcome to Mission First, the podcast to learn from successful entrepreneurs changing the world for the better. In this podcast, you will learn from entrepreneurs who have already found product market fit and are scaling up fast. We discuss their challenges and the strategies they have applied to make things work. Think of it as a masterclass about business and product innovation, growth marketing, and leadership. I am Gilles Toussaint. I help mission-driven companies exceed their revenue objectives with growth marketing, product-led growth, and LinkedIn personal branding strategies. I'm going to thank you. Thank you very much for having me. This is mission first. So can you start by telling me what's your mission? So, so at Handprint, we are on a mission to regenerate the planet at scale uh, using the power of technology uh, and partnerships. Our vision is really to upgrade the global economy that is today mainly extractive into an economy that benefits nature. And for that, we develop an infrastructure platform and um, nature crediting protocols. So can you explain us a bit who are your client and basically what your product uh, does for them? So we are a positive impact marketplace. What we sell is nature credits. A nature credit is a unit of nature restoration. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, carbon credits, but uh, for a higher variety of ecosystems like coral reef restoration, seagrass bedding, uh, mangrove restoration as well. So we put a price not only on the functional ability of nature to absorb and sequester carbon, but to do more things. And there are companies that buy, that buy those nature credits to build natural capital to increase their ESG uh, credentials, basically. That's one type of clients that we have. They also access uh, you know, a dashboard of tracking what's happening, the KYC of the of the project on the ground that are all curated and all of that. That's the marketplace portion of our business. And we have another uh, uh, capability, which is to white label our product, our marketplace and our tracking tools. And for this, we have big companies uh, that are paying us monthly subscription license uh, fees to be able to white label our technology platform to become the handprint of their own industry in the banking space, in the ad tech space, in the gaming space, in the telco space, etc., in the loyalty space. Um, and uh, this is uh, these are really two different types of clients. One type, the first type, are really focusing on making an impact. They are, they are purchasing those nature credits. The other one, they are purchasing a technology that enables them to do things around nature restoration. And that enables them then to use these things to engage the, their clients with and, and, and to, to, to get their clients to understand the impact or to improve their impact. But yeah, to absolutely. Exactly. Um, or it can be, uh, let's say, a, a end user of a iBanking application, a, a payment card that restores nature with the cashback, for example. Um, our technology platform, our infrastructure has been integrated into uh, some of those uh, software that enable banks to monitor their payment cards. And they are able to integrate into iBanking experiences some visual components uh, to show their end customers about their impact, like an interactive map that shows uh, pictures, that shows notification, um, etc. So it's really a tool to engage. And what's, what's the beauty of nature restoration is that it tells a story for months, for years, right? The, the coral reef that you restore is bringing back biodiversity. So let's say uh, after 10 months, we see a new species coming back to the reef and our NGO on the ground that has 
deploy the tools. So we also uh, develop tools for NGOs to digitize their reporting in a, so that they can report in a science-based way. They can actually take pictures, report in a certain way on the platform so that data is available. And our corporate clients can engage their customers saying, hey, remember the coral reef that you planted eight months ago? Look at this beautiful fish, this new beautiful bio biodiversity that's coming back to the reef. Life is coming back. Of course, they have access to a lot of quantification, scientific analysis as well. Uh, but the, this engagement portion, it's really what's driving the business. Perfect. That's very clear. So before we, we go back to how you pivoted from smaller businesses to, to uh, big corporates. Um, can you tell me a bit which context do I need to be aware of to understand where you are at right now? You know, going back to your childhood, your past experience, your career, what explains how you are right now at such a position with such a high commitment to change the world for the better? With a... I think from a general perspective, I've been always very close to nature and curious about nature. So probably this has played a role in, you know, how I, ch I chose my career path. But to be, to be honest, maybe it's, the, it's not the key driver. I think the key driver is really this idea that, or this willingness to crack something, right? And when we, when we look at the big picture today, we have a, a system, a capitalist system, that is uh, actively destroying uh, the planet. So it's actively detrimental to natural health. And just imagining that we could maybe crack, just like, you know, we hack a computer system, a server, maybe there is a way to crack this, to turn it into a lever of good, right? And this idea that I was thinking about for a long time, before I actually met my two co-founders, I. It's probably what has been driving me the most. I have a little background when I was, you know, a young teenager in computer hacking. I created this uh, website in France called Radi Radio Hacktiff. Now, when I meet meet people that knew about a little bit about hacking, they they tell me, "Oh, you are the you are the master of uh, Radio Hacktiff in France." So I I was in in that space a little bit at the at the level I would say I was publishing uh, tutorials to inject, to do a SQL injection, this, this type of thing. So not like high level hacking, but always, I always had this uh, drive of like understanding how things work behind the interface. And, you know, if I send something, it's, if I send, send some code, what's the reply, how to interpret it and maybe how can I, can I get it? And ultimately the, the, the economic system capitalism is like a, a huge machine, extremely complex machine, but can, can we maybe hack it? Can we crack it and transform it into a lever of good? At least that's a, that's a perspective that really excites me. And that's really this excitement more to be very honest huh, than, a, than a love for nature. I love nature, but at my very local, my very local, uh, yeah, I do gardening, you know, I do outdoor activities. So I think to be very, very honest with you, I think the main driver for me as an entrepreneur is this idea that oh, maybe if I'm able to crack this, that's a, that's an amazing problem to solve. So I'm a, I'm a system engineer by background. My two co-founders are a PhD, one PhD in digital sustainability. The other one is in a PhD in climate policies. When I met them in 2019, they were commissioned by the United Nations Environment Program to write a report about how to use new digital technologies to benefit sustainable development. So you can see how it unfolds and, and can be the genesis, genesis story of, of Handprint. So basically, we were looking at ways on how to, how to help companies fund the restoration of ecosystems in a way that is efficient, in a way that is predictable. And why we wanted to tackle that problem is because in the corporate sustainability space for the past 20 years, consulting firms have been like holding hands of mostly large companies into a type of corporate sustainability practice that's evolving around what we call measure reduce offset, which is the main lever of action. There is an emerging type of, of action that's no longer about this that's 
looking at what the, what the science says in terms of how companies should synchronize action to address environmental uh, issues. In the case of the triple planetary crisis, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and also all problems related to nature and problems related to the quality of soil that we really need to, to solve as soon as possible. So for climate specifically, there is an energy transition to, to execute. That's really the, the we, we cannot avoid that. And then in terms of corporate action, especially for corporates that are in the service industry, in the digital industry, and that because they are in, in digital, because they, 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 they do service and not manufacturing, not mining, not transportation, they have a small carbon footprint. The mean of action for them is one, to align their business model with planetary boundaries, and two, help the Earth to increase its biocapacity. And how to do that? It's simply by funding the restoration of ecosystems that are vital for the planet, right? So, and that's, that's what we are uh, trying to do, uh, is to, to help companies to uh, make meaningful, verified, quantified action by funding restorative projects, restoration and protection of natural ecosystem projects in a verified way. Can you explain us a bit, what is a handprint? So handprint is a scientific term that describes the sum of your positive impact, as opposed to your footprint, which is the sum of your negative impact. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Hence your name. Yeah, absolutely. If this podcast helps you, please do me a huge favor and click on the follow button on your podcast platform. It helps to grow this podcast faster and to convince the most impactful entrepreneurs of the world to join me in these interviews so that you and other entrepreneurs can learn from them. Let's dive deep a bit into you know, how you found this new product market fit. How did you make that move? What, what were the different steps to realize we had to change? How did you decide? How long did it take? To and what were the steps you had until you, you, you found this product market fit? Because now you went from a few hundred dollars a month to, as you told me, multi-million dollar contracts within a few months. So first, it's a, it's a very long process and a a uh, multi-million dollar contract uh, until the cash is in the bank. <laughs> I'm always telling my team, like, let's, uh, you know, I mean, they are like uh, very exciting contracts and it requires a deployment. It requires a lot of work and our impact side, etc. So I would say there is still a lot of work to be done. Uh, we are very, very happy that we signed a massive contract in the, in the banking space to be able to deliver our service as a service to banks, digital wallet, payment providers, etc., in a very scalable way. So that's why it is a multi-million dollar contract. I would say that the steps that we have taken to, to get there were honestly very painful, very long. It's, it's not easy work. It's, it's exciting work, but it's every problem we solve, three new problems appear. And the way we've all, always tried to approach it, have it's not always been the, the right approach. Uh, it's a lot of, you know, a lot of test and learn. I think probably what we tried to do in the beginning was like uh, quite upside down. We tried to scale something and provide value where we, where the ICP or the target market did not really see value. For us, it was value because it was useful for the world, but really not for our ICP. I give you an example. When we started to address e-stores, right, e-commerce, our backend was a spaceship. It was like, it was the, maybe the most advanced way of accounting for nature, carbon absorption models to quantify, to access in real time. While really what, what e-store wanted is a counter of number of trees on their homepage. So we were delivering value that that was hardly monetizable. They were not willing to pay for that. And the luck that we had is we, by complete luck, we found a company 
that was willing to pay for that, that was willing to pay for the big full-on set and even more. They wanted to pay for, they were to, to white label that technology, basically. And when we realized this, we were like, okay, we really need to, to follow that path. It was a very long discussion, you know, a B2B enterprise uh, contract, especially when you don't have experience on that like us, right? They tend to be extremely long. For us, it was a 18 or 20 months neg commercial negotiation while delivering a POC for them, etc. But we did that. And really, we did that in parallel of our, you know, product delivery and trying to, to find product market fit. And we realized that, okay, this idea that some companies in some industries want to become the handprint of their industry, may maybe that's something that's replicable. And maybe that's something, and even if we don't replicate it through a standardized commercial offer and a, and a product that delivers that service, maybe in the beginning, if we do everything manually, let's try to find out if it's replicable and if it's scalable. So we came back to the roots of like, you know, of like coming back very with a, with a lot of humility <laughs> to the, to the, to, to the basics and the very beginning asking like those big companies, okay, would you see value in this? Uh, let's start this. And the best uh, way to assess if it's, if it's a good idea or not is uh, really a willingness to pay. So we would just like follow the path of all of the willingness to pay validated and, um, uh, and I would say the, the luck that we had is that we secured the trust of a very big actor in the, in the financial space that, uh, saw in us an opportunity to create a competitive advantage, uh, an opportunity to, to future proof their business because they saw all of this sustainability regeneration coming and they wanted to ride that wave. And because we had this great technology that's able to deliver this, the tracking, the engagement of end user customers uh, on regeneration and restoration of ecosystems with like, you know, interactive maps where we can follow in real time what's happening on the ground, receive pictures, quantification, how many, you know, species are coming back to your coral reef or to your forest, etc. All of this, yeah. After securing the trust of this uh, big, big uh, multi-billion dollar company player, that's where we, you know, we started to see a product market fit. And then the work starts in like standardizing the offer, standardizing the service delivery, restructuring the team as well, because the B2B enterprise is completely different than being a low touch SaaS and marketplace as we used to be. So uh, it's a huge shift. It's not, and the, this shift is not even finalized now. We are still in the process of finalizing that shift. So a painful, eye-opening, uh, interesting, and honestly, with a lot of luck type of experience, to be very honest, because it, we might not have gotten, you know, the, the, the right person that, the, the right people that trust us in the, the type of company that at that exact moment need that service. It's also, it's also really a matter of luck as well. So you start to, you have all of a sudden a, a bigger client who start to be interested into your product that they want to white label. You see interest there. And then you said, you know, you start to deliver proof of concept with them and you were, and it's, you said it can take, you know, up to 18, 20 months to, to negotiate with them. But how at that time you said also you were measuring willingness to pay. Did you kind of agree on a smaller amount for a pilot? And then meanwhile, you get going and you measure the willingness to pay by willing to pay for that pilot. And then meanwhile, while developing the, the, the product, with them, you negotiate a bigger deal for after. That how it works. So yes, it, essentially, it's we. It's, it's very common. Huh? This is uh, probably in the most comp most uh, of your audience that have done a pilot with a, a large corporate. They we scope a pilot project. We told them this is the price. They agreed. So it's not only a way to validate willingness to pay for the future. It's also a way to to log them in in a way. Right, yeah. to, to secure future commitments, right? So, yeah. So what advice do you have? What did you do right? And what, what, what are things that you would do a bit differently? I would say if I had to do it again, I would say 
no to more opportunities. It's super hard. Huh? And in the beginning, we are in this divergence phase where we want to say to, to yes to anything and then converge into, okay, what is the, what really is the substance? What is the commonality between all of those willingness to pay? You know, what is the, the 80% that's uh, the intersection of, of all of these uh, uh, people that are willing to pay for uh, our service? I think no, saying no is super uh, powerful even for the future. If you have a corporate that say, oh, we want to do this, this, this. If you just say like, guys, sorry, we have a pipe of, and you know, you are always talking to 20, 30, 50 companies. I don't know. We have a pipe of 15 companies. If I do this, I really derive from my roadmap, but here is what, what we can do instead. And you, you know, you give the very standard, uh, maybe you miss some opportunities, but for me, that's what I would do in the beginning, because the risk of not doing that is to create many distractions in your teams and create misalignment with really what we are, the, the common objective of the company, what you are after. Which is, which is finding product market fit only, right? It's not delivering this project for this big corporate because it has a, a nice logo. It's always good to have a nice logo on the website, but saying no, I would say is, is also really powerful. You told me last time that you had some uh, data, like case studies where showing, but you managed to show the ROI, like positive impact of your, of, of, your, your tool with a few clients. Can you iterate a bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. So really the, an important aspect of our mission and how we want to crack, you know, the, uh, the, the, the economic system to make it a lever of growth is based on the realization that today there are two levers of action for corporates. One is regulation. They are forced by law, by law to engage in climate action, to engage in restoration activities, etc. And the second one is goodwill. You have like a visionary leader that, that is either anticipating the regulation or that want to, to position the company as a forward thinking leader that is conscious about environmental problem, etc. which is great. But only those two levers are not enough. So what we're really trying to do is to create a third lever of action, a third reason why companies should engage in climate action. And this reason that we are trying to create is to make it profitable or to make it a, a winning corporate strategy, I would say. And for this, every time that we have open a new vertical, so a new industry, e-commerce space, uh, in the payment space, in the ad tech space, and now in the retail banking space, we have measured the impact that our integrations had on, on the, the business metrics of our client. We started with e-commerce. We measured 16% increase of sales using A-B testing, using Google Optimize, basically. So the version of the website, the e-store with handprint had a 16% uh, card conversion increase compared to the one that don't have handprint. Another one in the ad tech world where our partner Tids uh, which is a French uh, company, a multinational company uh, in the advertising tech uh, industry. Uh, they uh, hired a, a, a data study company to, to do the same. To, it's not possible to do A-B testing per se in uh, the ad tech world. So that's why they hired this data company that really that made uh, surveys and so on. And they realized or they demonstrated a plus 9% ad recall, which is the main metric that they are looking at for this uh, when they launch uh, digital campaigns and a few other metrics that, that increased. And it's really what we're trying to do, right? And probably you're asking, like, yeah, okay, you, you measure. And all of this is basically based on a secret sauce. So let me, let me say a few, a few words about this. So my co-founder Ryan in 2021 wrote a paper about this. This paper won an award from the Financial Times, and this paper focuses on a case study, how Enforest, the, the Chinese platform, integrated regeneration into customer experiences in a certain way, using gamified structures, in, in a very precise way, 
that created viral engagement and that uh, basically ended up being the, the one of the most regenerative customer application of all times. I think in six months, they replanted 350 million trees. How those trees are monitored and all of that is, a, is another question. And we can always, uh, you know, criticize this, this uh, type of company. But what's interesting is like how they created so much virality, so much engagement, and why in the Western world we we don't get that virality. And the answer is very simple. Hey, before you jump to the next part of this episode, one quick info. If you don't want to miss the best strategies for entrepreneurs like you, sign up for my newsletter with a link in the description. You will receive a summary of advice from each episode, get personal recommendations based on your startup stage and industry. And you will also receive my most useful growth and LinkedIn marketing strategies. Just follow the link in the description to sign up. Back to the next part of this interview. In, in the Western world, our very Cartesian mindset, or maybe our capitalist uh, mindset, makes us, makes us think of carbon footprint as something that we own. All right, this is your responsibility. This is your carbon footprint, right? It's the it's dominant narrative. And in all integration that you see in the banking space, in the e-commerce space, in the ad tech space, we keep telling customers, oh, this is your, this is your pollution. And what are you going to do about it? In, in this integration, in Enforest, what's super interesting is that they don't speak about this. And it's maybe their Confucian uh, approach of like, we as a community have a total objective. The way we delimitate responsibility between us is not so relevant. What's relevant is to reach that common objective together. We have an objective of 100 million trees to be planted by next uh, quarter or whatever. Let's do that together, right? So, and it, it creates, and all, they, they added also mechanics of gamification. For example, you need to wake up at 6 a.m. in the morning to redeem some points, energy points. If you don't, your friends can connect on your profile and steal your points. So it created an entire generation of, you know, people that woke up super early to get those points and then they can play with those points. And, and this paper of my co-founder highlights this basically. So that's, that's the, the secret sauce, I would say. And it's always been something that we, we want to spend time on when we open a new vertical, a new industry is to make sure that the way we do it benefits the company so that it is replicable. And then you, we will have even companies that are not super interested in sustainability. They will join the train because ah, they, 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 they look at the bottom line and they see it's a, it's a winning corporate strategy to follow. When we talk about this big contract with a fintech client, so we went, you finally found your ICP, which is retail banking. Do you have any advice on the negotiation of the contract itself to find the right persons there who to talk to how to talk to because you got about 20 you had about 20 clients in beta from this profile did you figure out ways to improve things along the way yeah of course i would say but we also we've made many mistakes on this now as soon as possible we need we want to identify who will be involved in the decision-making process, the ultimate decision-making process? Who are those people? What are the names of those people that will be involved at the end? Not only our point of contact, but we really want to you know, understand behind the scenes how, it's, how, it's wor how it works. And for this, it's a lot of discussion, questions, and even like repeating questions to our point of contact, making sure that as soon as possible, as many people are looped in, right? it, doesn't, it doesn't stay a... Uh, 101 or 201 or 202 conversation, but we have the, the strategy, the sustainability, the product, uh, the CEO, if necessary, as soon as possible, aware of the product, aware of what's happening. And then it's almost like a game of addressing objections. There will be always objections on the, until we align on a commercial, on commercials, basically, but even after in the deployment. And so I, I really see it as a, as a game of like, okay, what is going to be the next, next objection and how to turn that objection into our advantage, right? Oh yeah, but I don't know. 
you know, typical objections. Uh, oh, uh, no, it's great, but let, let's do that next year. Maybe like Q3 uh, next year is, you know, so it's, it's really about finding ways to, to, to address uh, objection in a systemic way. And for things that work, the, the, you know, the, the working, the punchlines that really turn the situation, write them down. Okay. Now it's in the sales playbook and it can be, re it can be replicated by anyone in the team. Basically sharing that knowledge is, is super important. But honestly, this one, this aspect is the, probably the aspect that we have struggled the most with probably because in the founding team at handprint, I'm a, I'm an engineer by background. My, my two co-founders are PhDs. So we are, we are domain expert people. We are not, we are not salespeople. We are not commercial people. Like how to draft a commercial proposal, how to, you know, what are the, the tax, uh, in, during the sales process, this, all these things we had to learn the hard way by failing, but also spend quite, quite some money in coaching <laughs> in, uh, you know, so I feel like just even a few months ago, I would not have felt comfortable at all to answer your question <laughs> because I would be like, honestly, I'm still trying to figure out. I don't want to, you know, to give my perspective because it might be not so well informed. Now that I've received coaching and I, I, I see some things that are working. I, you know, I can, I can definitely uh, share those uh, two things, but it, it, it's honestly very common. Uh, you know, it's, it's very common knowledge, I would say. When it comes to clients who are telling you that, oh, you will come back, you know, we can talk about this in a year. What are the things you have learned or what are advice that you have on, you know, how to convince them to move with you, you know, faster? That is uh, growing, that is healthy. What we do is depending on the pressure, Every two, six months, it depends, uh, we actually increase the price. We increase our license price, our base price, our, our price for white label, our price for not always for uh, impact. Actually, impact is uh, once uh, every year, but everything related to technology and the service that we deliver, even like customized uh, help. You know, uh, they need to access uh, some of our brains uh, in the team. One of my uh, GG founders or I don't know, uh, our regenerative impact experts um price over time so that they are like some kind of deadlines like hey guys after 30 january uh this and these items are increasing due to, to the pressure in our pipe uh we are, well you know we want to give one customer one key account manager for clients to deploy in good conditions so we also have uh, you know um on our side some uh, imperatives uh, and that's why we are increasing the price if you uh, contract uh, by then, you have access to this preferential, preferential price. If you can even sign before, I'm also able to give you an additional discount, for example, you know, those things to accelerate signature. Uh, but it's, it's really about bringing tempo to the, to the conversation. And for this, price increase uh, happens to uh, be a, a, a good driver. And it's also healthy for your business because as you're uh, increasing the value of, the, of your technological stack, by uh, publishing, by releasing new features, of course, the value of your stack increases, right? So um, it's, uh, yeah, this is something that uh, that's that I feel really, really works well. Yes, yeah, so time pressure is, is, is definitely something that works very well in, in sales. And something that made me uncomfortable is when you use that, you know, when you make it think as it's going to be a something applied that is really not there. But I think what I hear here that I really like is the fact that you apply that for everyone. So, you know, you take a decision and that's very easy to say, you know, as a software company, every quarter we increase our price there. And then it's not about, it's really about being honest with the client and saying, you know, like we, we, we do that Absolutely. with everyone from next quarter on, this is that. And usually when you do that, it's, it also works very, very well. In terms of, of growth uh, for your company, I mean, I know you are a big fan of growth as a hacker as well. And I see you are super, super active on LinkedIn and are sharing a lot of very insightful content about regeneration, um, handprint and so on. Why are you sharing so much on LinkedIn on the different, what, what are basically, what are your, your organic channels? What are the channels you are using to grow? Because I guess as well, with these long, a long, like bigger client, it takes a long time to be able to convert them, to attract them. The sales cycle can be very, very long. So what are the channels you are using in terms of growth and uh, what's your strategy there short term and long term? So we have three channels. We have outbound, inbound and referrals. 
We don't, we don't do paid ads. We used to do in the past. Outbound, we used to exclusively do that. And it has its limitation. It's free or it's not by its time, but it's a, it's a super low cost. So we put in place some, uh, you know, sequences and all of that. But I feel like now the market is tired of like receiving sequences of emails that pretend that uh, it's not automated, you know, the, 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 this part. So what we've done quite early on and that has proven to be successful is to display value. Like, look, this is how how credible this impact is. This is the right methodology to do that. If you have this problem, here is a, a way to solve it in a better way and create like white papers, one pagers about certain problems, a manifesto, uh, videos that explain certain concepts for people in our space and all of that. So those are called lead magnets. So people to download uh, the white paper, they basically give their, their email address and just so yesterday we had like 150 downloads of one of our white papers. Okay. In those 150 people, probably there is 10 leads, right? So uh, it's, it's a lot. It's also a lot of noise. Huh? You're, uh, you have a lot of students, a lot of consultants in sustainability that are, that are interested in that knowledge because they're able maybe to resell it or to, to benefit from it in, in some form. But there are some very interesting leads. And so when we publish a white paper, well, now we are publishing a white paper every two months. It's well referenced. It's written by my two co-founders. So, you know, it, it's almost a scientific paper or people talk about it. I've, I've seen people mentioning that in, in conversations, etc. It's a way for us to generate leads that are coming to us. And sometimes they are qualified. We call them, we identify business opportunities. If there is, that's every, everyone is happy. We are able to help them. If not, we publish more and we, we, we try to converge towards something that the most actionable for our exact ICP. Like what is the dream white paper that the decision maker in our ICP company wants to have now? You know, so for this, we ask a lot of questions to our prospects and all of that to, to have the best title, to have the best hook in our LinkedIn uh, um, uh, messages to really speak to that person first. So that's the inbound. And we have now a, I would say, a very sophisticated inbound strategy with uh, our head of uh, marketing and communication, Maria, that is, that is amazing. Our two co-founders, myself, I participate as well to, the, uh, to drafting those, those materials. So it's quite sophisticated. And then the third one, I was mentioning referrals. We call that ambassador network. So it's a, it's a network of people that basically send us introductions and they, they are remunerated in, in case of a successful contract signed. It's people in, uh, it can be people that are working for VCs, people that just have working in corporates that have a large network. It can be a clients. It can be. Is it a uh, manual investors. process? Is it a manual process, the referral one, or it's just like, so, a, you know, like you bring me something or you, you use some tools for, for, with some links? So I would say not tools, but we have now developed an engagement strategy because if you don't engage with your ambassadors, they are never, you are never going to be top of mind so that they actually produce, they, they generate leads. So of course we send them our newsletter, etc. but we also engage specifically on, on like, yeah, for example, when we're launching handprint for banking, boom, email, thanks to you. But we also give them news about their introduction, their past introduction. Uh, hey, James, thank you so much for introducing to X company. The, the conversation has led us to this. It means for now, nothing's happening, but maybe in the future, Thank you again for this introduction. In the future, we are we think that we are looking at this and this type of company. And then a, a very simple filter: company pre-IPO companies of more than 500 people that are in the in the financial sector. Here are two examples. This, 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 this. You're sure that the next companies next company that comes across his desk that fits those criteria, boom, it's an introduction. So it requires an engagement strategy. That in the beginning, for a year, for two years, we didn't really put in place, and we we're like, oh, it's not working. This this ambassador thing, you know. But it requires work to make it work, actually, just like any other channel. So, and now we really focus on those three channels, 
less and less on outbound, more and more on inbound and ambassador network. Ambassador network, inbound with white papers, lead magnets that you share, not through ads, but in that case, LinkedIn organic channels and, uh, and SEO, I guess. And yes, SEO for this is quite externalized, but there is a continuous SEO effort. Yeah, absolutely. SEO. Hey, just a 10 second break to tell you. I just released a free video presentation to explain the three key strategies I use to get 7,500 change makers to follow me on LinkedIn and to reach more than 1 million people this year with my posts. It's free. Just follow the link in the description to download it. What has been the hardest for you as a founder? I would say as a, as a CEO, it's to make the transition from founder CEO to CEO of the company, because it changes a lot of things in terms of founders dynamic, teams dynamic, what you expect from the teams, the, the excellence on the, on the reporting that needs to, to happen for you to be able to take decisions. Sometimes it's hard to make decisions. It's much easier to not make hard calls and just wait and see and hope, you know, but, and I think this is really the part that it, at the same time is the, is the most important in any case, as the CEO, you will be responsible for every mistake in the company and every success is going to be the success of the team, right? You are, so be, because of, of this, it's important to be very okay with all the failures. Yeah, these failures. This failure has uh, happened. It's on me. Ultimately, I make the calls. Uh, so let's move forward, right? So maybe, uh, and what, what you want is to, to meet these, these milestones, these failing moments as quick as possible and with the highest frequency as uh, possible. And in the beginning, it's a little bit, it's maybe a little bit hard to face that reality. And also in my case, because I had I have two co-founders that are older than me, that are extremely expert in, in the field. It maybe what I've been struggling with in the past is to make that transition from lead, from being one of the three co-founders, right? Building the product, speaking to clients with my co-founders to being the leader of the company. Right. And this is, and because it also uh, implies that, uh, you know, I need to, uh, yeah, uh, it implies many things, <laughs> but yeah, this, this transition is definitely hard. I've been speaking with many founder CEOs that have been, that have the same opinion. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely not an easy one. Yeah. From, from founder to leader, basically, but many like don't hesitate to take coaching, to get some help to, because I really don't believe one can make it happen without external help. If, unless it's, if it's your third, fourth venture and you, you know, you know the process by heart and you've visualized every step of the way, how you need to evolve and when it has to happen. Otherwise it's, it's a really, really tough one because it also, it also implies that you need to communicate that change to your teams and to your co-founders. It's not only you implementing things, it also, it's also like educating the team and, and the whole, not holding hands, but like bringing together people into that new normal. And this one is, is the foundation of how the company can actually scale. If you, if you miss that, that, that phase, the company will never be, be able to scale. So it's a, it's a really important one. And that changes the dynamic as well, how you work with. Absolutely. In the beginning, you know, uh, we were three, we hired a, a tech team and maybe we were like 10 and we were doing everything together, like on Zoom all day long together, doing everything, tech, legal, fundraising. And suddenly you need to specialize, you need to implement a, a reporting structure. So there is someone in charge of making the calls as a founder, you if you need to report to the, to the CEO uh, as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it definitely changes the dynamic and it's not always easy. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a hard one, but the most important, this is really, yeah, it's a, it's a, ultimately there are more important problems that are before product market fit. 
which is uh, finding product market fit, basically. But if you miss that step of the transition, I believe it can uh, delay the product market, like because you're able to iterate faster if you have a if you have a strong uh, organization to deliver the work, right? So yeah, it's probably something that that uh, needs to be done before product market fit, I believe. What is the best advice you've received as an entrepreneur? I would say we are very lucky because we have we have a lot of amazing advisors that are basically investors from our pre-seed around. And because of our mission, I have to say that we have a lot of people that are helping us because they are interested in the space. They are extremely knowledgeable, extremely experienced founders from different industries, and they just want to help. And they've been consistently helping. It's not like just someone saying like, hey, I want to help. It's like, People that are delivering coaching uh, one to two hours per week for months, for years, <laughs> you know, it's like we, we feel extremely lucky. And in that in that pool of people, we've been uh, we've received a lot of a lot of great advice. I have one that I can be interpreted as a bit a bit cowboy. <laughs> I love cowboy. It's, it's better to ask for it's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission because you want to take shortcuts. Right? You want to. Yeah, that that's that's what that's the that's the entire game. <laughs> it's like it's to do things fast, right, and in the right direction. That's that's where the complexity is. You can do f- stuff fast, like we've been doing many times. We've been doing stuff fast in the completely wrong direction, uh, and then the realization of oh shit, it was in the wrong direction. It's painful, but like it's really about accepting uh, the reality and bouncing back. So this one. About, it's a good one. Uh, yeah. to, at, to, least, yeah, to, at least it's fast. Exactly. Be wrong, but fast. Yeah, exactly. Be wrong, but, but fast. And sometimes, uh, you know, you are, I don't know, like we, we negotiate a commercial contract with a large uh, corporate. We, we are under the impression that hands are shaked and we're all aligned. And suddenly the, the legal team of the large corporate comes into the picture and suddenly the contract we had the, the we had this two times recently uh, suddenly the contract is completely renegotiated because oh we didn't understand that this or or the comma uh, now the comma I exaggerate but this term can you do that if this happens and uh, so suddenly that's actually the, the real negotiation just like you know you know in a fundraising from a term sheet to actual documentation so yeah, it's it's those are painful but painful moments, but full of learning as well. The coma can be very important. I know. <laughs> I I have a friend in Berlin who study law in Germany, and he has a book. I was surprised to find her bo- a book in his in his uh, I mean at home <laughs> about the coma. So a, a a book a law book where it was a full book about where I mean about the coma. So I know it can be very, very, very important. Do you have one podcast, book, or anything that you re- you would recommend people to listen to or to read? One that comes to mind is a book from April Dunford called Obviously Awesome. In our case, it's really like it's a book that has really changed the way we talk about our product, we describe our product, we describe what we do, and that has helped us explain all of that complexity beyond the restoration of and fit that into a frame of reference that people can understand and that's it has really it's it's still an ongoing process huh? uh, but this book really is extremely concrete it's it's a framework first do this then do this then do this then do this you know it's not a theory theoretical book uh, it's a very pragmatic book and just read the first chapter the first chapter is an assessment of, okay, are you in a situation where you need help from that book? If you hear this from your product team, if your, if your client says this about your product, you need to read that book. And we're like checking everything. We're like, okay, <laughs> we really need to read that book. And it really, uh, it really, really helped us to, uh, uh, to improve on uh, product positioning, uh, uh, product positioning is very important and it's, it's not the, you know, the first thing that you, that you think about, like how to explain from 
the perspective of the buyer and what makes sense for them. So it's, uh, yeah, April Dunford, if you listen to us, thank you so much. Yeah, it's a great book. It's a book that really also changed the way I was also yeah, positioning myself as a, as a, as a freelancer. And it, it really helps. I mean, the whole framework is useful for uh, helping yourself to helping to position yourself. Uh, and also you can use a similar framework to like in, in your way to find product market fit based on the same thing. It's about, you know, if interviewing clients, getting the words out of your client or interviewing potential users, getting the words for them and how they see you uh, better than, you know, how you see yourself, because usually it's, it's all about how people see you. And, uh, and yeah, from the first chapter, I think it is about the fact that like, if you have a lot of. If you have a lot of clients who are staying, who are happy with it, but it's hard for you to convert the clients at the beginning, it means you have a problem of, you might have a problem of positioning. Uh, yeah, so great, great book. Thank you for the, for the reference. Last question. Can you tell me one thing about you that I would not be able to find online? I'm actually just starting with a few friends, just starting to buy a land and build a regenerative house so it's a it's a house with no concrete foundation on stilt to help the soil breathe basically surrounded by a permaculture garden a miyawaki forest off grid with solar panel natural treatment of gray and black waters with ponds that create nutrients for the permaculture garden so it's my new weekend project and i'm very very excited about it and it's becoming yeah a side hobby that is extremely exciting and i i'm super excited just by the idea of you know visualizing myself living in harmony with nature in this new type of of housing so uh, yeah that's definitely something you uh, you won't be able to see online and that's where i guess it's, if it's your weekend project it's something where close to where you're living for our audience you you don't live in france right? no absolutely i've been uh so currently I live in Indonesia, in Bali, after spending eight years in Singapore. What is your ask for, for our audience, if you have one? I mean, where can people contact you if they're interested about handprint? Um, do you have a specific ask for, for the people listening to this podcast? Even if you feel that somehow you are developing something that might be competing with handprint, in most cases, we can actually partner. We, we And it's really something I keep telling every time I have the opportunity to speak in a podcast or in an event. The space is huge and we need to join forces on things. So partnership is extremely important to us. We partner with a lot of organizations that in the beginning we thought like, oh yeah, no, actually they 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 are somehow competing with us. But in our industry, I think it's a unique opportunity in the sustainability, in the green tech space, it's a, we have a unique opportunity to bring collaboration, the power of collaboration over competition for once. So definitely, if you think you're a potential partner or, a poten or if, you th if you think that uh, you potentially competing, do not hesitate to reach out. We're super happy to share. For example, we, we are sharing in open science, open source, part of our uh, technology, our calculator for, uh, ecosystem, um, for a nature integrity target. We will be in the future as well uh, sharing more things. We, we have published a map of the nature tech world scene where we feature many many different companies to make sense of like what is this scene and how do companies interact with each other each other in that in that world uh, in that ecosystem as we say and so uh, yeah do not hesitate to reach out on linkedin i'm just one dm away cool matthias thank you very much for all your advice today uh have a great day and uh, hopefully see you soon meet you soon one day in bali that'd be great thank you so much for uh, having me Hey, if today's episode was useful, share it with your entrepreneur's friends so that we can all have a bigger impact on this planet and give it a five star on Apple Podcasts. That will make my day. Thanks so much in advance. Have a nice day.